This week on El Cara Ham Radio, we thought we had the Arcom RC210 controller ready to go, but when we got it up to the repeater site, not so good. Those remote sites were not uh, being rebroadcast over on the repeater side. So we're going to have a look and get it back up and running. That's what's coming up next, this week on El Cara Ham Radio. Well, if there's one thing that I've learned in my short career or hobby with amateur radio is that the equipment that we use many times requires quite a bit of what I like to call fiddling. <laughs> so with the Arcom controller, it is so capable uh, that there are just many little menu options that you need to have a look at. And uh, we thought we had everything nailed down. There's a, a little jumper that we use for active high versus active low. And we thought we had all of the programming ready to go. And it's new to us, you know, so we're not exactly experts on this particular controller. But we're very happy to have two of these now. Technically, there's three. And we're going to have another one just like it in Monticello. But as we began to do the what we thought was going to be the final installation of the ARCOM that would then allow those remote sites to be funneled into the repeater from even further distances away, the remote site inputs wouldn't open up the ARCOM. They would come in on the voter, which is right above the ARCOM here in the picture, and the voter would say, well, yes, uh, remote site number one just came through. Remote site number two just came through. That voter is there so that if more than one remote side tried to come in at the same time, whoever gets there first locks out the other frequencies. So it would come into the voter, but it wasn't making it to the ARCOM. And we thought, well, it could be a hardware issue, maybe, or it could be a programming issue. We thought we had the programming figured out. We even double-checked the jumper for the active high, active low coming out of the voter. And the great thing about the ARCOM is that it will support either. We also had the second ARCOM, and we thought, well, we'll bring it up to the shack. This is yet on another day. And uh, we had everything hooked up to it eventually. And guess what? Practically the same behavior. And we're thinking, hmm, it's not a hardware problem if we're getting the same behavior on both of them, or at least the odds would be incredibly low that it would be exhibiting the same bad behavior, or just not what we wanted it to do. So we had to take the ARCOM back out and take a look at it down at our main shop, which is at uh, headquarters, which is AC4DM's uh, house and farm. So we took it back down and we started looking at some additional configuration settings, and we found two or three that were not accurate. Uh, I think we had carrier and tone on Port number two, which is where the remote sites are coming in, all we needed was carrier, no tone. And so that was one thing. And then the ARCOM through the programming side, utilizing the macros, allows you to link uh, the three ports uh, in various combinations, one, two, three, one, and three, which is what we had. And we needed one, two, and three to be linked so that the remote sites would make it over to the repeater. And we made those adjustments and we got it working. So eventually the ARCOM's working. Now that's great, but one of the things that we'd also been talking about for some time, and it was also on our projects for the year, was to put a laptop up at the 88 site so that we could actually program the ARCOM with unique and interesting messages from home. You wouldn't actually have to go up to the site. And although we have installed a few items to make remoting into the shack much easier, well, let's put it this way, the, to be able to remote in for the first time, we, we always had to go up to the site if we needed to make any changes, which is not exactly convenient. And so uh, uh, we had a member donate a laptop, and we made sure back down uh, at the shop where AC4DM has his main uh, gear and so forth, that this laptop would work with the Arcom that he had uh, there in the garage. And so what we're doing now is now that we're at the 88 site, our main repeater site, we're double checking that the laptop utilizing this USB to serial adapter will work. We had to download a, 
a older prolific driver. Some of you will know what we're talking about there so that the USB to serial would even work so that it would show up as a COM port which the Arcom is expecting. This particular laptop is a rather new Dell uh, that uh, didn't have any serial ports, and most of the laptops haven't for quite some time. So we've got a little uh, adapter coming out of the USB-C port there on the left, and then we have the prolific adapter, USB-A to serial, going to a um, an extension, serial extension cord, back to the Arcom RC210, and we're just testing. Can we download? Are we on the right COM port? And everything's looking really, really good. So we felt confident. Uh, also on this laptop, we've installed some remote software so that we can remote into this laptop uh, with the right credentials and so forth. The last thing you want to do is install any type of computer hardware at any of your remote sites that would be easily um, potentially exploited or attacked. And you can't totally prevent some of the attacks that are out there, but you can certainly minimize it by making sure that only specific ports are open or just don't open as any if you can help it. And uh, one of the things that we've ensured that we've always had is a VPN, that if we want to get into the shack, you have to use a VPN to get in. We have very few devices that are communicating outwards. We have WireZax, D-Star, uh, and a couple of things. And this will be an additional item that we'll have to ensure is protected. And here, um, KK, what do we got here? KJ6 FTR, KD6, I'll get it right in a minute. KD6 FTR, one of our newest members from moved from California is just double checking that all the menus and everything are working. And that's what we're doing here is just to make sure the laptop's going to work. The last thing we wanted to do is put the laptop at the shack, then try to go to remote into it. It wouldn't work. Now, Below left, you can't see it yet, but I'll bring it into view here in just a minute. I've got a tablet uh, that also has the remote software installed, so we can double check utilizing the Wi-Fi in the shack. Can we access the laptop? And here he's just double checking that we can set the clock and so forth. And uh, so we wanted to double check that the remote software is in fact working, and that'll come up here in just a a moment. So again, we're just finalizing, just making sure that uh, the laptop and the controller will work. We also wanted to make sure when we close the lid on the laptop that it doesn't put the machine asleep. It doesn't really do anything. And uh, that way the machine is basically always running uh, with the uh, and logged in. Well, technically not logged in. You'll have to log in when you use the remote software. And there's the tablet. And you can see we're mirroring uh, what's going on on the laptop on the tablet using the remote software. And uh, again, just double checking everything uh, to make sure that it's going to work. And everything's going really, really well. Now, this is Wi-Fi in the shack, so we're not having to come in from the outside. Uh, the type of remote software that we're using here, it wouldn't matter one way or the other. But again, you just never know until you truly test it. So now it's time to put it into the actual rack here. Now, right now, we're just placing the laptop on top of the Arcom, as we'll see here in just a second. And we're gonna turn it around here in just a moment. Eventually, we're gonna get a keyboard shelf uh, that will actually come out from the front side. And you, then you can open up the laptop and, and do what you need to do to program the Arcom. But for now, it's just gonna rest on top. There's plenty of ventilation inside of the rack and Mike is gonna clean up the cables. We had an extension cable close to six feet, I think it was. We didn't need that with the laptop actually in the rack. So here's my connecting the shorter cable to the actual adapter, USB to serial port adapter, there on the back of the laptop. And then he's going to swing around to the front and turn the laptop around so that it'll actually open from the front. And again, eventually we'll have a keyboard tray that will actually come out uh, from the rack itself. And that'll make it really convenient uh, to be able to get in. And we can use this laptop for other purposes as well. Right now, it's only connected to the controller, but it's a big step for us. We're a small club. Having a laptop, a decent laptop there at the site to do these kinds of things is a step up for us. And uh, we've got uh, a number of people in the club today that understand remoting into computers and so forth, and uh, we'll be able to potentially go into that Arcom controller and do custom messages and so forth. So we're really excited. And it's one step at a time. I always tell uh, folks that I uh, teach and uh, here in the hobby, uh, you, you may have these super large or just projects that you're going to be doing over time. 
and uh, you're not going to get them all done in one day. Usually you've just got to, you know, space it out over weeks, sometimes even months in the case of some projects. Uh, but eventually you keep pounding away, you're going to get it done. And that's the case here. Now our remote sites are back online. Our reach for the club is, you know, many hundreds of square miles. And uh, we have the laptop here in the shack that we can remote into and make adjustments to the controller any time. Now, I know some of you old timers are out there saying, well, huh, we used DTMF back in the day. That is still a capability. Uh, we, uh, we do have deep TMF possibilities with this controller. We just don't use them as much. And several of us are computer guys, and this is how we would go about it uh, instead of using DTMF. But DTMF is an option, uh, even with this controller, and it's enabled on this controller as well. So it is something. Now, the uh, video that we've got here is uh, I'm actually uh, back home and I'm opening up the remote software to get into the laptop. And this is, uh, I'm down in Middle Tennessee and this is up in Kentucky. And we just wanted to show that it's working perfectly. Uh, I'm checking the version, I'm setting the clock just to make sure that it's completely up to date. It, it was already up to date, but just double checking that everything's working well. And uh, even going into a few of the other buttons here, we're going to download the configuration in case we wanted to make changes. And uh, just takes a few moments. Uh, I think it's at 9600 baud or something like that. But these uh, controllers don't take very long to download the configuration. And so this is a much better test at distance. We could update the controller from anywhere as long as we had an internet connection. And that's exactly what we were hoping for. Uh, it's a Windows 10 laptop. Uh, <laughs> I'd say some of you already been getting those. Hey, do you want to upgrade to Windows 11? Uh, we shut that down. <laughs> We're just going to leave it Windows 10 for now. And uh, everything's working great. And as you'll see, there's the configuration coming up. And uh, we just need to uh, find some folks that want to become uh, subject matter experts on this controller because it is so capable. This is the macro that we're running, and there's a number of codes in here that uh, allow us to do what we need to do. We're not going to go into all of those today, but the one bit that that just was our last hurdle was that last digit on the end. It was a, a link of 1 and 3, which was code 119, and we switched it to 121, which is to link all three ports on the back of the ARCOM together, and that way the remote sites would, in fact, be rebroadcast through the repeater. So we've made those changes, and everything's working out really really well. And as I look at a few other screens here remotely, again, take on these projects, folks. You may not have anybody that is an expert on an RCOM RC210 controller today, but if you give yourselves time and, and don't be hard on yourselves, these controllers aren't terribly expensive, highly customizable, three ports, and they've got a brand new expansion card that you can get as well. And I think you get three more ports. I think you take one port to get three more. So with a total of five ports, you could actually manage up to five repeaters and or devices with this controller, five with one ARCOM controller. So we're going to, we're going to look at that. And in a future video, we're also going to show you some of the programming that's possible and how to do a custom message. Uh, a lot of times these repeaters are just putting out standard repeater messages, or in the case of this controller, it, it has some messages that it can put out. It can tell the time, uh, you know, the net is going to start at 730, that sort of thing. But you can record your own messages, and that's a lot of fun. So in part five, we'll see if we can't come back with some custom messages. I'm KY4BDP for the Lake Cumberland Amateur Radio Association with the ARCOM RC210 up and running and being able to remote into it. Thanks for watching and 73.